Have you ever heard of a condition that makes your joints too flexible or one where your head feels like it's too heavy for your neck to even hold it up? I'm Dr. Betsy Grunch, a neurosurgeon and someone who is passionate about making the invisible visible, especially when it comes to rare or misunderstood medical conditions. Today, we're going to dive into Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and a condition that often goes with it craniocervical instability. Yesterday, I presented the case of a 32-year-old yoga instructor that came to my office with complaints of neck pain. She's noticed pretty much her whole life that she was really pretty flexible, but she never really thought anything of it. She's had joint pain over the years, headaches, brain fog, mental fatigue, and she felt like for most of her life, doctors just ignored her symptoms. So we're going to talk about her real medical condition that she didn't even know that she had. EDS or Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. It's a group of connective tissue disorders. In simple terms, people with EDS have a problem with collagen. It's a protein that holds everything together in our body, your skin, your joints, your blood vessels, even your organs. These patients usually have stretchy skin, joints that bend too much, frequent dislocations of their joints, chronic pain, fatigue, amongst many other medical problems. And it can be really disabling, even if you look fine on the outside. I mentioned yesterday that she felt like her neck was like a bobblehead or wasn't really attached to her body. This may represent something called craniocervical instability. It's where the connection between your skull and the top of your spine becomes a little bit unstable. There's ligaments there that hold everything in place. And in conditions like EDS, those ligaments can become too loose. Imagine that your head is like a bowling ball. And instead of your neck being made of cables, they're made of rubber bands. That's what CCI can feel like, leading to headaches, neck pain, dizziness, vision problems, brain fog, and fainting. EDS is not as rare as we once thought. The hypermobile type H EDS may affect 1 in 500 to 1 in 5,000 people, and up to 90% of them are women. Now, CCI is a little bit harder to pin down the frequency, but it's not uncommon in EDS patients. Here's the problem. How many young women go to their doctor and complain of fatigue headaches, and chronic pain. It can go undiagnosed for years. That's why awareness is so critical. Well, how do you get it? EDS is usually inherited. Some types are autosomal dominant, meaning one gene from one parent, you can get the disease, while others are autosomal recessive. That means you gotta get it from both parents. So if someone in your family has loose joints, chronic pain and unexplained symptoms, it's worth talking to a doctor who understands connective tissue disorders. How does it feel to be an EDS patient? I thought I was just clumsy. I just can't hold my head up at the end of the day. My doctors keep saying it's anxiety. Maybe it is all in my head. These are real stories and patients with EDS and CCI can be dismissed, gaslit, or misdiagnosed for years. Young women are often gaslit in medicine due to a complex mix of historical biases, systemic sexism, and outdated cultural norms within the healthcare system. Medicine has long been a male-dominated field. Women were excluded from medical training and scientific dialogue for centuries. As a result, many conditions that affect women are under-researched, misdiagnosed, and dismissed as psychological. You've probably heard of the terms hysteria, PMS, and chronic pain. Many healthcare providers carry unconscious biases. They minimize or doubt women's pain and symptoms, often attribute their concerns to anxiety, depression, or emotional instability. Assume that they're exaggerating or being dramatic. Let's think of other conditions that affect young women. Endometriosis, fibromyalgia, and POTS. These conditions disproportionately affect young women, and they're still poorly understood and dismissed for all the reasons that I just explained. Let's get back to EDS. Making the diagnosis starts with a detailed physical examination, something called the Baten score, which measures hypermobility. It helps us identify patients that may have EDS or other conditions with hypermobility. It's a nine point scale based on five physical maneuvers. You can pause this video to look at all five of those maneuvers. And in adults, a score of greater than five out of nine 
is generally considered indicative of hypermobility. Genetic testing for EDS can help with certain types. Cranial cervical instability, on the other hand, requires advanced imaging. Now, here's the thing. You can't just do regular x-rays or a regular MRI or CT because often if you're laying down, what you do on a CT or MRI, you don't have any abnormalities. If the joints are truly lax, they only really move out of place if you're upright or flexing your neck. So getting an upright MRI or a dynamic CAT scan where you flex and extend your neck while you're doing the imaging is very helpful in making this diagnosis. If we go back to our patient's flexion extension x-rays, meaning a picture of her when she's leaning forward and a picture of her when she's leaning backwards, you look at C1 and C2 on both the flexion and extension and there is a little bit of abnormal movement there. This is compared to a patient with gross instability. Here you can see the space between the C2 bone and the C1 bone being about like that and upright. But when this particular patient goes into flexion, she has gross instability where you can see C2 and C1 now has a difference of this much space. So CCI can vary from very minor to extremely concerning. On that last patient, if we didn't do flexion x-rays, you never would have even noticed that that patient was potentially become quadriplegic. Why are the ligaments so stretchy? In EDS, their collagens is kind of like the glue that didn't really dry properly. It makes their tissues weak and stretchy. That can affect your skin, your joints, and your ligaments, including the ones that stabilize your spine. And sometimes those weakened ligaments can't sustain the weight of someone's own head. In severe cases, it can cause brainstem compression or it can mess from anything from balance to breathing. So what's the treatment? I wanted to point out that most cases of CCI are not treated surgically. Usually start conservatively. Bracing, therapy, and avoiding activities that can potentially worsen the instability. But if someone's neck is unstable, shouldn't you need to fix it? Here's the problem. Diagnosing this can be extremely challenging. Patients are usually frustrated because they hurt and they want a solution for their pain. But you have to understand that the surgical fix for craniocervical instability is literally fusing the skull base to the cervical spine and essentially makes most of neck range of motion completely gone, meaning your head is basically immobilized on your body and you can't move your head. So performing this surgery on one of these patients is not a decision that's made lightly. In performing surgery on EDS patients, they often don't heal well because, well, their collagen, you know, the protein that helps you heal from surgery is weak. So they can have many complications from surgery, anywhere from wound infections to failed fusion. So these surgeries should really only be reserved for patients that truly have gross instability of the cervical spine that can potentially lead to neurological compromise. While there is no one size fits all solution, there are many innovative therapies that can help address the underlying cause and help these patients get relief of their symptoms without surgery. This is a diagnosis that requires a comprehensive and multidisciplinary approach to their care. Things like physical therapy programs to help promote stability, strengthening their supporting muscles, and enhancing their range of motion can be really important. Temporary usage of cervical collars may provide some benefit to restrict excessive moving during the healing process. Medications such as anti-inflammatory medications can help manage pain and inflammation. Interventional options such as injections may provide relief lifestyle modifications, psychotherapy and support, regular monitoring can help improve their quality of life. This chronic pain can affect their overall well-being. So what happened to our patient? She went on to be properly diagnosed with HEDS and went on a conservative route to help manage her symptoms. This included no more chiropractic visits and she had to stop teaching yoga it's because those extreme range of motions in chiropractic manipulation as well as in yoga were making her symptoms worse. Because EDS patients can often have problems with their blood vessels, chiropractic manipulation puts her at risk of having a dissection that could potentially lead to a stroke. So far, by making these lifestyle modifications, her symptoms have dramatically improved. Most importantly, she has some answers finally to all of these symptoms that she thought was in her head for years.
May is EDS Awareness Month. I'm proud to help bring awareness to all of you bendy baddies. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care, and make sure you sign up for my newsletter to get medical conditions and more information like this delivered to your inbox every single week. And remember to stay tuned next week, and we'll go through another case.